The perks of being a wolf are has become one of the most iconic coming of age movies out there, and for good reason, because the writing of it is absolutely amazing. But besides the beautiful writing and the iconic characters, this movie also has one of my favorite soundtracks ever. So good actually that it got me to the Smiths, and from that point on, I stopped being popular and my life was ruined forever. Now, is this topic an excuse for me to talk about my favorite movie, but also make it themed about music? Absolutely. But I do think that this movie wouldn't really be the same if the soundtrack wasn't as iconic as it is. So make sure to like and subscribe, I've already made a video similar to this about The Sopranos, and check out the channel if you're into old music I guess. This is the beautiful soundtrack of the perks of being a wallflower. Enjoy! Okay, Crisis from the Future here. I've been working on this video for two weeks now, but every time I tried uploading it, it would get blocked in this many countries. No matter what I did, Lionsgate or whoever owns the rights to this thing would take it down. I replaced most of the scenes with behind the scenes footage and bloopers, but I did keep the crucial parts. If you want to see the original video, it's on Patreon for free. Also, subscribe to me there because I'm still making zero dollars from this thing, but at least all of my audience can see it. Anyways, yeah, sorry, back to the video. Could it be another change? The opening scene starts with the song Could It Be Another Change by The Samples, and it immediately sets the theme for the whole movie. Firstly, you have this nice acoustic guitar and these lyrics about falling in love and learning to love yourself. Classic coming of age movie stuff, and I think this is exactly what the director was going for. Not just the opening scene, but the first few minutes give you this idea that this is just a normal movie about a teenager starting high school and struggling to make friends. Of course, we know that this is not the case. He goes to school and he sees the older kids bullying the younger ones and they start making them jump around and calling them freshman toads. Now I don't know if this is how bullying works in America or if it's intentionally made to look funny to deceive us, but yeah, it just starts like a regular high school movie. There's a the thing though, if you're rewatching it, you notice that the opening scene starts with a tunnel where Sam and Patrick went through later in the movie. But when you see it for the first time, you just get that feeling of a regular high school story, because that's how Charlie sees high school as well at first. Just 1385 days that he has to go through. The song Could It Be Another Change, along with the camera going through the tunnel, foreshadows Charlie's journey throughout the whole movie. Him starting to open up about his life, falling in love with Sam, but most importantly, learning to love himself. The song now has obviously become heavily associated with the movie, because when you search it up on YouTube, everyone is talking about the perks of being a wallflower. But I think it's a great song, even without this context. After the opening scene, we see Charlie struggling to make friends, just like the average crisis viewer. He tries to sit at lunch with his sister and his old friend, and nobody really pays attention to him. Meanwhile, he's describing everything that's happening in a letter to his friend. But I'm sure this friend won't really be important, don't worry. He goes home after making one friend, and that friend was his English teacher, so obviously he's pretty depressed. Wait, is that Greg from Succession? No wonder he plays the role of an abuser so well. Greg, or Ponytail Derek, introduces Charlie to the Smiths. I guess people on TikTok were right, the Smiths are male manipulator music. Charlie, being this lonely boy who can't make friends, instantly falls in love with the band. And you know, being someone who can relate to Charlie's loneliness, their songs really hit hard. Later, we see him covering the walls of his bedroom with the Smiths posters, but for now, he's obsessed with the song Asleep. Now, the Smiths have a reputation for being a sort of depressing band, but Asleep is just on a whole other level. I don't think they could have chosen a better song to fit with this movie. The song talks about loneliness and being tired of this life. The protagonist wants to fall asleep and never wake up again. He wants to escape from this world. The melody of it is just so chilling, and that piano throughout the whole song really makes you feel like this is the end. While the piano is playing, you hear Morris's voice that sounds like he's tired of everything in his life. He just wants to give up, and there's no hope for him anymore. Asleep is easily one of the band's darkest songs, and it's just heartbreaking seeing Charlie listen to this song so much. But obviously, there couldn't have been any other song that could have fit better. Asleep feels like it was written for Charlie, and the more he listens to it, the worse he really gets. This song is the first hint the viewers get about what's gonna happen to Charlie towards the end of the movie. Also, I just want to say that the piano notes that play during Charlie's monologues just add so much to the whole thing. It makes you want to cry every time he mentions Aunt Helen, especially if you're re-watching the movie. Anyways, after that whole montage of Charlie being sad, we cut to him making friends. Yippee! He nervously goes up to Patrick and starts talking to him. Later, Sam joins them too, and after an epic high school football win, they go to King's. While at King's, Charlie and Sam realize that they have something in common. They both listen to the Smiths. Ha! <laughs> Losers. But unironically, the music they use doesn't only affect the movie, but it also affects the characters' day-to-day -day lives. 
This is what the outcasts of society, for lack of a better term, listen to. And this is what makes them connect with each other. It really shows the impact music has on socially awkward teens. And it makes viewers like me connect with these characters a lot. While dropping Charlie home, we see that Patrick and Sam are listening to Teenage Riot by Sonic Youth. Ah, you to turn it down, you're gonna make us death. So be it, it's rock and roll. Now this feels a little bit on the nose, but I guess it makes sense for a bunch of teenagers in the 90s to listen to a song that was big in the 90s. Teenage Riot describes Sam and Patrick. They're these kids who are cooler than everyone else, and they don't care about what other people think. They just want to live their teenage lives, rock and roll style. Well, that's how Charlie sees them at first, but later we find out that they're way more complex than just some teenagers with cool jackets. The song does make them instantly likable though, at least for me. After that, Charlie goes home and sees Ponytail Derek slap his sister, and gets flashbacks of his own aunt, and the way her boyfriends used to abuse her. Who cares about that though? It's homecoming time! <laughs> Now, this is one of my favorite scenes ever. We see Charlie standing alone in a corner and everyone dancing to a slow love song, but then the music changes. Do you know what starts playing? Come on, Eileen. Sam and Patrick freak out because they're surprised that people at school are playing actually good music. They start doing the living room routine. Now, despite Come on, Eileen being like the best song ever, I love this scene just because you can feel that everyone is happy for at least that second. Sam and Patrick are dancing like nobody's watching, and Charlie finally gets some confidence and joins them. It's so nice to watch Charlie break his shyness and finally be happy for once. Even when you're watching the movie for the first time, you can tell that this kid has gone through a lot, and seeing him genuinely happy means everything at that point. Also, this living room team has become a trend on TikTok and it pisses me off, because I just see a bunch of happy couples on my For You page while I'm stuck here making YouTube videos. How dare you be happy? After the dance, the group goes to a party, and when they enter Low by Cracker Place, which is another rock and roll song that goes well with the whole vibe of the party. Charlie gets tricked into eating a weed brownie and becomes the non evil version of me when I was high in the Netherlands. Dick tastes so nice. Fuck, that's a good <laughs> Dick tastes so good, they'd never get. Jokes aside, while Charlie's high, Tugboat by Galaxy 500 plays in the background. The song is a tribute to Sterling Morrison, who after quitting the Velvet Underground, started becoming isolated and went on to become a tugboat captain. The song talks about quitting the social life, leaving the society and finding where you want to be in life. With this beautiful but sad guitar that almost sounds like it came from a Cure album, Tugboat goes along perfectly with this important moment of Charlie's life. After talking nonsense for a couple of minutes, he goes to talk to Sam, and while the song's still playing, he tells her about his friend who committed suicide last year. Sam gets shocked by this information and goes and tells Patrick, while Here by Pavement starts quietly playing on the background. Welcome to the island of misfit toys. At this moment, Charlie's at peace, and the beautiful and gentle guitar by Pavement shows us that he finally achieved this feeling that he so much needed in his life. He's finally happy, at least for this night. Also yeah, Patrick is gay, lol. I will talk about queer culture and being on the island of misfit toys later in the video, but now we have the most iconic scene of the movie, Heroes by David Bowie's Plague, and god they couldn't have chosen a better song for this scene. I know it's one of Bowie's biggest songs, but it's like him and Brian Eno put actual magic into this track. Heroes is just one of the songs that feels like it came from out of this world. It would make any movie scene iconic, but especially this one. The song talks about two lovers, who just for one day want to forget any worries they might have in life and live the moment to the fullest. The day they spend together is so magical that they forget everything else in this world, and at that moment they feel infinite. You can see the exact moment where Charlie looks into Sam's eyes and instantly falls in love. Truly a wonderful scene. Also, a fun story about me and this scene. I watched this movie when I was like 15 on some shit Albanian channel. And the lights went out in the middle of it, so I never found the title of the movie until like 2 years later. After I found it again online, I watched it and made a playlist of all the songs mentioned in the movie, and it got me into the Smiths and alternative music, and basically got me where I am now. No joke, this is a real story, I don't think this channel would have existed if that tunnel scene didn't get so ingrained into my head. And the fact that they also couldn't find the song that plays on the radio makes everything so ironic. This movie means everything to me. After that epic scene, Charlie starts listening to Sam's music and he starts making mixtapes for her. We get another montage of Charlie being in school, this time he's happy. 
and he's listening to Sam's recommendations. The song playing in the background is All Out of Love by Air Supply. Charlie says that Sam says that they're kitschy and brilliant, and I completely agree. You can clearly see the contrast between Charlie's mental health before and after he met the group, and going from the Smiths to Air Supply just highlights this even more. This moment of happiness and big rock ballads only lasts for about a minute though, because we have another problem. Patrick is gay. Not only that, but Brad is gay as well. Wait, Brad can't be gay? He's a football player. Well, at least that's the logic Brad's dad uses, because he's heavily Christian and heavily against his son being happy with himself and loving who he wants. Dear God by XTC starts playing, and we hear Charlie explain to us what's happening between Brad and Patrick. The two had been seeing each other for seven months, but whenever they fooled around, Brad would just get drunk and say that he didn't remember anything. When they finally did it, he told Patrick that he loved him, and started crying because he knew his homophobic dad would kill him. Brad and Patrick's story is a really sad one considering that such stories still happen to this day. Brad is not only going against his dad, but he's going against everything he believes in. He starts doubting his religion and everything he's learned about it up to this point, hence dear god playing. He's been told his whole life that this lifestyle is wrong, and every time he would hook up with Patrick, he would just see it as a sin, as him losing to temptation. That's why he got drunk every time, because he felt like this relationship was all a big mistake and he needed to forget all of this. Finally, he realizes that this isn't just a one-off thing, but he actually loves Patrick. Of course, he knew this all along, but he kept lying to himself this whole time. When he realizes this, he starts thinking about what his dad would think of him. He knows that his dad's unconditional love suddenly will turn very conditional if he finds out that his son is queer. There's not even a chance of his dad actually accepting him, because he knows his dad more than anyone else in this world. He knows for a fact that his dad won't love him anymore, and he can't do anything about it, except hide who he truly is. Hide himself from his dad and hide himself from the homophobic friends he grew up with. Brad knows that this won't be an easy fight, and he's not sure he's strong enough to do this. All he can do at this moment is cry. This reveal of Brad's and Patrick's relationship perfectly transitions to my next point. The Rocky Horror Picture Show and the strong connection of the queer community with socially awkward people. Even though the bullying in this movie is depicted a little bit cartoonishly, it still shows the massive effect it has on people who are already struggling with their self-esteem or struggling with mental health issues. As much as the average person doesn't want to admit it, a lot of these misfits are in fact queer. I don't live in a place where queerness is seen as normal, and neither do Charlie or Patrick. Speaking from experience, when you're dealing with bullying while growing up, usually the only people who accept you for who you truly are, are queer people. Basically, the nerds and the gays go along together. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is a celebration of not being normal. Embracing what makes you different from the rest of society, instead of hiding yourself just because people might judge you. It's so important for you to not forget who you truly are, because shaping yourself after other people's standards will never bring you happiness, it will just make you boring. This message doesn't only go to queer people, but to basically anyone who doesn't get accepted by their peers for who they are. And of course, this resonates a lot with Charlie, who is clearly enjoying the show. After that, we go back to Charlie being desperate and sad, because we have the next two songs from his mixtape, Temptation by New Order and Seasick Yet Still Docked by Morrissey. Now obviously, these songs talk about Charlie and his love for Sam. Temptation doesn't only talk about Charlie, but talks about everyone in that room. It is a room full of teenagers and teenager emotions, and of course, between this group, there's a lot of temptation. Mary Elizabeth likes Charlie, but Charlie likes Sam, but Sam likes Craig, and so on and so on. It's just a big room of people filled with temptation, ready to temptate all over everyone. But going back to Charlie and Sam, obviously the music that they listen to connects them a lot with each other. We're put in this room where a song from Charlie's mixtape plays, and we're focused on the way Charlie sits or the way he looks at Sam. The viewer is Charlie. But then Sam says this. Okay, I was supposed to show a scene here, but you know, Lionsgate and all that stuff. So I'll just explain it. It's the scene where Sam talks about how she used to listen to the top 40, but then she heard Pearly do drugs drop, and thought that someday she'd be at a party in college where she would find somebody that would make everything okay. Pearly do drugs drop is a song by one of my favorite bands of all time, Cocteau Twins. Now what's special about the Cocteau Twins is that their song don't have any real lyrics in them. It's just gibberish that sound like real words. But the point is that you make your own meaning of the songs, the same way Sam made her own meaning of her life. She stopped listening to the top 40, aka she stopped being what everyone wanted her to be, and instead she became herself. Another thing about Pearly Doodrops Drop and every song the Cocteau Twins made is that it's fucking beautiful. The song sounds like it came from heaven, 
and Luce Frazier's singing just gives so much mystery and beauty to the whole thing. It's incredible. And the way I see this song is the way Charlie sees Sam, this mysterious and beautiful girl that came into his life out of nowhere and changed everything. Both Temptation and Pearly Dewdrops Drop are pretty similar to each other. They come from the same era, 80s Britain, but there's still a clear contrast between the two. Just like there's a clear contrast between Charlie and Sam. Every song that these two mention in this movie carefully chosen to say something about their characters. But right after that, we see Sam dancing with her new boyfriend, what Charlie listens to Morrissey like the hopeless romantic is. This isn't enough though, because Craig steps in to change this morbidly sad mixtape and puts something like Bust a Move by Young MC. It just further shows the difference between Charlie and Craig, and the fact that Craig really has nothing in common with Sam. Anyways, we see Succession Greg again, and Ant-Man tells us to accept the love we deserve, blah 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 blah. It's Christmas and the gang does Secret Santa. Charlie gives Patrick a mixtape with the song Asleep on it twice, meaning that he wants to sleep with him. Twice. Charlie gets a cool new suit, but before that, he gave Sam a present. That present was something by the Beatles. In that moment, Sam realizes that Charlie does love him. Who knew that good music actually gets you girls? They share a sweet moment and Sam gives him a kiss. Their relationship doesn't really go anywhere from there. Well, at least for now. Who cares about relationships though? Because Charlie's taking more drugs. The old backlash by Bangwater starts playing, which at first just seems like it's put there because Charlie's tripping balls, but there's a deeper meaning behind it. The song talks about your life getting worse and worse, getting something stolen from you, aka Sam getting stolen from Charlie. But then it continues to talk about going against your leaders, your idols, your gods. After this song ends and Charlie talks to Sam, he starts getting flashbacks of his aunt was someone he really looked up to. This slow and heartbreaking piano starts playing and Charlie leaves the bar to go lay in the snow while he thinks of his aunt. She's driving and in the passenger seat she has something by the Beatles, the exact same disc that Charlie gave to Sam. This song clearly means a lot to him and him giving Sam this song shows how strong his feelings are for her. After seeing the disc, we see Aunt Helen getting in a car crash and then Charlie passes out and wakes up in a hospital next morning. He's starting to get bad again. The gang goes back to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. This time there's a problem. Craig's missing. I completely forgot who Craig was at this point, but apparently he was supposed to touch Sam's boobs during the performance. Oh no, who's gonna be able to replace him now? I wonder if anyone in this room would want this role. Charlie, take off your clothes. Jokes aside, we see Charlie's and Sam's relationship go somewhere interesting, and him getting even more wrapped up with the queer community by wanting to be in a heterosexual relationship. He touches Sam while the song Tasha Tasha Touch Me by Susan Sarandon plays. Yeah, this song is one of those blink it and you miss it moments. It's not really obvious at first why the director used it. Despite Sam's and Charlie's relationship seemingly advancing, the scene right after this is Mary Elizabeth asking Charlie out and him saying yes. I mean, you could see from the very start that this thing is not gonna end well, but the way Charlie ends it is the most horrible way someone could ever end a relationship ever. As soon as they go on their first high school dance, he chooses to talk to Sam in the corner instead. After that, his relationship with Mary Elizabeth starts going further and further, and he's not really ready for this. We get a pretty uncomfortable scene of them about to have sex, but thank god her parents get home. This thing goes on for a couple of weeks. Charlie is so sick of her, but she can't stop talking to him, and he doesn't have the courage to break up with her. This goes without saying, but if you're ever in Charlie's position, please for the love of god end the relationship. What he's about to do is the most evil thing you can ever do to your partner. By the way, as if their differences weren't obvious enough, they also have completely different music taste, and Mary Elizabeth doesn't let him play the songs he wants to play when they make out, just showing how controlling she was in the whole thing. Okay, now we get to the horrible scene, the truth or dare part. The crew's playing truth or dare, and Patrick dares Charlie to kiss the prettiest girl in the room. Now Charlie's been poorly handling this relationship for a couple of weeks now, Surely it costs him nothing just to kiss Mary Elizabeth one more time, right? Nope. He goes and kisses Sam and ruins basically everything, counting backwards by throwing music plays in the background, as if to show that Charlie just destroyed all the progress he made with his new friend group. All of the connections he had made for these past few months, gone after one kiss. The thing about this scene that's extra painful is that it genuinely feels like a nightmare. Obviously what he did to Mary Elizabeth is horrible, 
This scene is like an introvert's worst fear. You finally manage to make some friends and in your head start getting these intrusive thoughts about doing something that's gonna ruin the whole friendship. Charlie literally gets an intrusive thought of telling everyone how he feels about Mary Elizabeth right before the kiss and he so much chooses to do something a thousand times worse. This scene is just so tough to watch, I have to skip it every time I rewatch the movie. Right after this moment, the story takes a really dark turn. This movie isn't just about a regular high schooler trying to make friends anymore, it's about Charlie battling with all the trauma his aunt has caused. He desperately tries to get his friends back, but he has no luck in doing so. They all seem to hate him now. This isn't the only dark turn the movie takes. While Charlie is battling with all of this, we learn that Brad's dad learned about his relationship with Patrick. Brad talked about being afraid of his dad throughout the whole movie, but when you see his face and all the bruises he got from his dad, you realize that how much of a serious matter this actually is. This isn't just a dumb high school story anymore. This is what reality is for most queer people out there. What happens to Charlie and Brad feels so real because these things were pretty common back then and still are now. Bullying and homophobia do threaten the lives of everyone, and it's not just a myth. Of course, Brad isn't in a position to go against his dad at this point, so he breaks up with Patrick. This breakup completely changes both of them. Brad goes back in the closet and starts being homophobic again, while Patrick's just angry and depressed. Because all of this, we get this scene. Okay, another scene I can't show here. This is a pretty famous one, so most of you guys probably know it already. It is the scene where Brad calls Patrick the F word, and they get into a fight and then Charlie comes in and beats everyone up. Epic. This caused Charlie to get his friends back again, who knew that all he had to do was just beat up some homophobes. His friends accept him in the group again, and everything's fine for now. Mary Elizabeth finds a new boyfriend, and Patrick takes Charlie for a ride. During this ride, we hear the song Araby by The Reavers, a song that has 16,000 plays on Spotify. The song talks about the gift from Araby, this gift being the love the singer has for his partner, the reassurance that he always will be there. The song goes along with Patrick finally letting his guard down and opening up to Charlie, and him being there for Patrick. After some dumb high school stories, he sits down with Charlie and tells him exactly what happened that night, and in the end, he kisses him. What happened with Brad obviously affected Patrick a lot. He still thinks about him, even though he keeps talking about what a free spirit he is. Their relationship ending so traumatically will make him never forget about Brad, but also it will cause him to be afraid of loving who he wants in the future. Thankfully, both him and Sam get into the colleges that they wanted, and we see Patrick turning into his happy self again. We get this montage of the group graduating and Charlie narrating everything, while Pearly Dewdrop's Drop starts playing. Now this is a magical moment in Sam's life, and of course her song starts playing. She managed to get into the college she wanted to, and she looks like she's finally happy with herself. Everyone seems to be getting a happy ending. Patrick and Sam got into nice schools, Mary Elizabeth got a boyfriend that actually likes her, Mr. Anderson is staying as Charlie's teacher, Charlie gets another kiss. What a nice story, right? Well no, because there are still 20 minutes left on this movie. The gang all graduating means that Charlie's back to having no friends. All of the friends he fought so much to keep. They'll all be in a completely different state now. He's back to square one. This causes Charlie to get bad again, and he starts getting flashbacks of Aunt Helen. Only this time, we finally see what actually happened with her. I'm like your sister. Charlie, being the worst mental state possible right now, starts thinking that his aunt's death was all his fault. Even after remembering what she did to him, he still blames himself for the accident. This trauma has fucked up his entire life, and him not telling anybody what happened for all these years finally drives him into almost ending his whole life. It's so tragic seeing the way this affects him. He finally realized why Charlie's afraid to talk to anyone, why he struggles so much to make friends and to love people, why he constantly thinks of his aunt. Thankfully, Charlie's sister manages to call the police in time and save his life, but this ending is still ingrained into my head to this day. Charlie finally opens up and tells his therapist what happened with Aunt Helen, and he starts actually getting better. His sibling starts visiting him in the hospital, and eventually Sam and Patrick come back to visit him too. They tell him about their colleges and give him a mixtape. Sam found the tunnel song. The three of them get in the car, and we hear Charlie start talking about everything he went through, and what he learned from it. It's so comforting to finally see Charlie be happy, when you realize all the pain he had to deal with throughout his whole life. He deserves a little bit of peace more than anyone else in this world. And of course, there couldn't have been a better ending song than the tunnel song. Heroes by David Bowie. And in this moment, I swear, we are infinite. Oh. 
Let me know what you guys thought of this soundtrack. Obviously, this movie means the world to me, and I really hope I did it justice with this video. I've already made two videos about The Sopranos, but I think the next part of this soundtrack series will be on either Train Spotting or Judge or Rabbit. Make sure to comment anything else you want me to talk about and subscribe. I swear I am trying to be consistent, but my PC decided to shit itself right when I needed it. Also, check out the Patreon because I need to get a better mic and a camera. Thank you, thank you.